that uh, i would like to thank uh, st joseph's college dr jay and dr parmesh for, for inviting me to deliver this lecture on species recovery and conservation of endangered species in india on the occasion of uh, world environment day uh, thank you uh, parmesh and thank you uh, dr sir so uh, today's topic for this webinar is on species recovery and conservation of endangered species in india i am hope i am audible to all of you okay so uh, so to, for today's webinar uh, the, i have just divided uh, my talk into five different sections so uh, the first uh, i will introduce uh, what is species recovery and then i will talk about uh, what has been the scenario of species recovery in india and then i will talk about uh, how we can one can go about uh, prioritizing species uh, for uh, carrying out species recovery and then i will talk about the a uh, need for a national agenda and then finally i will talk about the general generic methodology and share our own success with respect to few uh, species where we have carried out species recovery in western ghats so coming to what is uh, meant by species recovery okay so species recovery can be defined as a process by which uh, a decline of an endangered species uh, or a threatened species is uh, is arrested or reversed and the threats removed so that the species can survive in the wild okay so if uh, to just to illustrate uh, this point i have put a, a graph illustrative graph so where on the x axis you have time and on the y axis you have the population status so if there is a threat for that particular species and if there are you know anthropogenic it could be any threat it could be anthropogenic threats or harvesting or any such threat which could lead to a decline in the population status or population size of a species and over time this decline would reach a certain stage i would call a critical stage beyond which the species may not be able to recover on its own and unless there is an intervention of you know carrying out species recovery the species may go into extinction okay it may go directly into extinction and at this stage is what we call uh, you know these are uh, species recoveries undertaken it's very difficult to bounce back the population to what it was earlier so just to give an example uh, this is an example from uh, american bald eagle which was declared as endangered in 1967 and then went, it was also declared as nationally endangered in 1976 this a bald eagle it was a is a national bird of uh, america and uh, after the world war 2 uh, you know there was a heavy use of pesticide in agriculture and uh, because of the heavy use of uh, pesticide especially ddt uh, which then contam went on to contaminate uh, the waters and uh, the ddt accumulated in the fishes and when eagle fed on those uh, you know fishes which were Uh, filled with DDT, there was very uh, had a effect on the populations of this particular bald eagle. Especially, it led to uh, egg shell thinning, and this resulted in the decline of uh, the bald eagle from over a uh, lakh uh, pairs to just about 450 individuals. Uh, the no, it is not just DDT alone, but there were there were a number of other factors, including hunting uh, of this particular species which led to drastic reduction in the population size of this particular species and resulted in only about 450 individuals so at this time uh, you know two more two things were done one what it was declared as an endangered species and then they also banned ddt in 1972 uh, resulting in you know uh, less pesticide being you know gone into the water uh, systems and at the same time they also uh, carried out captive breeding and release of uh, this bird species into the nature and over time okay uh, the species which was about just 450 individuals raised to about 4500 uh, pairs of birds and in 1999 this particular bird species was delisted from the red list okay so this is a stage a critical stage at which they took undertook a recovery program and if at this stage if recovery program was not taken this particular bird species would not seen the light of today okay and uh, and because of successive uh, efforts this particular bird species has been now restored back into the wild so and there have been number of success stories uh, and most of them you know can point to 
US, UK, Canada, and Australia, where a number of species have been recovered or their population increased or stabilized or you know, captive breeding has been such an example, the milk witch, the green pitcher plant, the black-footed ferret, or the fringed orchid. All these, there have been a, quite a success of uh, you know, um, recovering them back into the uh, wild. So if you see the IUCN red list, uh, okay, so some, if you see the IUCN red list of species, there are about more than 31,000 species of uh, animals and birds which are threatened with extinction. And these are just, mind you, about, only about 27% of all the assessed species. Not all species have been assessed. Among the assessed species, 27% of all of them are threatened with extinction. Um, and among these include about 41 per percentage of amphibians, 25% mammals, uh, conifers about 34%, 14% birds, 30% sharks, and about 33% uh, coral reefs and other uh, crustaceans. And uh, if you look at the uh, red list, uh, no, species list over the years, there's been a constant increase over the years. From 2005 to 2020, from about 3,000 uh, species that were red listed in uh, 2005, in 2020, there are about 7,000 species, almost 7,000, 6,000 odd, 6,800 species which have been red listed. Okay, and this is data is just recent. Uh, as of uh, June 1st, 2020, there are about more than 6,500 species which are under critically endangered list. And we also, if you look at the right hand, uh, the spike, chart, you, you can see that about 3.5% of the species are critically endangered, 6.1% endangered, and about 8.3% are vulnerable. I, I think there's a background noise. I request uh, people to sh please mute your mics. Yeah. So we have about 2.4% of species already extinct, and some are extinct in the wild also. Okay. And if you look at uh, uh, details about each species, we have about uh, uh, mammals, about 203 species which are critically endangered, birds, about 225 species, amphibians, fishes, reptiles, insects, a number of species, more than 300 species of each of them are in the, the critically endangered list. And if you actually, uh, I have put star for some of these only, only mammals, mammals and birds, birds is almost, almost about 100% where, where they have actually uh, evaluated, evaluated that population. population. Whereas, Whereas the number, number of amphibians, amphibians only, only about 90% of amphibians, amphibians have been evaluated. evaluated. And so, and so there, there are still 9% which have yet to be evaluated, evaluated with respect to their population status. And number, and number of them actually also have to be discovered. discovered. So that's, that's another, another matter. So, and about 34% of fishes and just about 1% insects have been evaluated. And only about 8% 8, 8 of plants have been evaluated with respect to their population status. And based on that, you know, we have so many species of plants and animals which are under the red list. And if you look at plants in particular, there are about 3,325 species of plants which are under critically endangered. And this, as I told you, is only about 8% of the plants which have been assessed. Okay, but if you look at the recovery programs or species recovery programs, largely they have been on you know animal centric with over 95% of funds uh, to large vertebrates. And uh, among this 95% of funds, 50% have just gone to the top 10 species. We have, I have nothing against them, but I'm just telling, you know, the cost of recovery is quite huge. So for example, if you just look at bald eagle, $31.3 million were spent for recovering the bald eagle example that I gave uh, just a few slides back. And, you know, we have this uh, spotted owl, uh, scrub jay, Indian manti, uh, woodpecker, Florida panther, grizzly bear, and others, which, you know, there was a huge sums of money spent on recovering these particular uh, you know, species of uh, vertebrates. And, you know, most of them uh, are largely birds and mammals. There are very few uh, other uh, invertebrates or plants, for example, in this list. And if you look at Indian scenario, it is no different. India also has a number of species which are under the red list. And uh, if you look at the number of animals, uh, total number of animals, there are about 648 animals were there in 2018, which have been now uh, not 688 species of birds in, in June 1st, which are under the red list. And then the plants, 
which are, I mean, this is only the critically endangered list plants there are about 325 species were there in 2018 and in 2020 there are about 428 overall there are about 1116 species of plants and animals under the red list which which uh, comprises about 66% of animals and about 33% plants okay so in, in india also uh, you know traditionally species recovery again has been only traditionally has been animal biased animal based bias um, with uh, you know a lot of uh, money going into project tiger project elephant gir lion and garial conservation uh, large sums of money was spent on this and there have been success also it's not that uh, there have been failures but for example if you look at project tiger uh, from about 1411 in 2006 and 2018 there were about 2967 almost doubled uh, the tiger population almost doubled in 12 years because of the project tiger and in now we have more than 3000 species uh, sorry 3000 individuals of tigers all over the country and this was largely because of establishment of a large number of tiger reserves all over the country which helped in uh, establishing back their population though there have been you know a lot of drawbacks there has been a huge success with respect to the increase in the population size of tigers in in the country similarly if you look at uh, garial uh, conservation this health so has been uh, quite a success and uh, garial population which is largely distributed in the indo gangetic plains and in the pakistan uh, there was there was a large threat to its respect to habitat destruction and other anthropogenic pressures leading to fragmentation of the populations and uh, limiting their distribution and uh, in 1996 this particular species was under the endangered list i have seen red list and then the indian government uh, took a concerted made a concerted efforts to recover this particular species and uh, a total of nine protected areas were established all along the ganges and its tributaries which covered almost about 3000 square kilometers uh, apart from that there was captive breeding uh, and uh, a number of uh, uh, centers were established about six breeding centers were established where the eggs were collected from the wild and captively raised and these uh, captively raised individuals were eventually released into the wild uh, there was a restocking program and about 3000 juveniles were actually released at 12 different sites all along the ganges river and which resulted in the increase in the population size of these uh, garials and now we have more than 1500 individuals that are there breeding along this indo gangetic plain and if you look at plants that it has been very dismal uh, there have been only one ex- you know celebrated example of uh, recovery that has been taken place but uh right now we still do not know the actual status of this particular uh, orchid this is called the slipper orchid papillodium uh, dure where uh, first initial efforts were made to recover the species because this particular species was largely harvested from the wild because of its beautiful flowers and uh, uh, you know concerted efforts were made especially tuticulture uh, date plants were uh, you know made and then try they try to recover them back in the wild but we do not know now what has been the success of this uh, particular orchid and because we have uh, not seen them much in the wild so if you look at uh, the other plants especially medicinal plant scenario in the country there are about 950 medicinal plants that are actively traded in india of this you know most of them are obtained from the wild about 80% of plants medicinal plants are actually obtained only from the wild and very little is cultivated only 20% are cultivated and 100 medicinal plants are in the threatened category and these populations of many of these medicinal plants are under severe threat due to over harvesting okay and if you look at uh, the medicinal plant trade you know there is it has been a there has been a constant increase in fact in the last two decades there has been a huge demand for medicinal plants especially ayurvedic drugs leading to excessive harvesting of medicinal plants from the wild and many of these medicinal plants are harvested destructively you know the entire roots are harvested the entire rhizomes are harvested resulting in complete death of the individual plant and uh, with the increase in the demand in recent years definitely there is going to be uh, much more decline in the population size of these many medicinal plants so if you look at the data of these medicinal plants uh, you will see that almost about 40% are fall under the critically endangered and endangered list with 5% of them being extinct in india 
okay and a number of species of medicinal plants are also vulnerable about 39% of medicinal plants are under the vulnerable category and uh, if you look at uh, many of these medicinal plants many of the medicinal plants are endemic to the country that means like if their extinction in the country would actually mean extinction globally okay they would be completely exterminated globally if they are extinct in india because many of them are half of these medicinal plants are endemic to india and uh, many of them uh, almost 44% of these medicinal plants belong to tree life form that is you know if there are you know, tree lives unlike herbs or shrubs which grow faster trees take a long period of growth and if their reproduction is affected or if they have if they, you know if uh, if they are excessively harvested they take decades to regrow or bounce back you know to uh, and you know, recovering a tree species would really harvested resulting in uh, i think someone is you know writing on the board i think for uh, extensively uh, very destructively the plant either succumbs to those injuries or is you know infected with uh, you know pests and diseases and uh, if the bark is completely removed the regeneration of the plant is affected because it completely affects the reproductive function of the plant medicinal plants are also you know restricted to certain habitats okay they are like either to mystica swamps or riverine habitat and uh, if the habitat is if the habitat is destructed or destroyed they, these plant species continue to i mean they would become completely extinct so there are other uh, issues of medicinal plants some of the medicinal plants for example uh, this medicinal plant is called as nothopolis pneumoniana the called as map was earlier called as mapia is an important medicinal plant which yields uh, an important chemical called campotheisin which is an important anti cancer drug and after the discovery of uh, campotheisin in this plant this plant was you know excessively harvested for the western ghats in some parts of maharashtra in fact there was a 40% decline in the population size of this uh, species resulting in uh, fragmentation of the populations and shrinkage of the natural populations leading to you know a lot of inbreeding and there are a number of plants uh, which have very low population size in this ghats you know much 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 lesser than the example that i gave about the bald eagle or even the tiger uh, you know there are for example if you look at uh, semicarpus catlecanensis about two decades back there were only about 42 breeding individuals of this particular species and sensium travancoricum true had about 15 to 20 breeding individuals and a number of other medicinal plants had less than about 500 breeding sites were incredibly were incredibly low and what would happen if the population size reduces one thing that would happen is there would be inbreeding and this is for example in this case for example autocarpus hirsutus this is a, a study where uh, the seeds were taken from different sized uh, groups which had different population size of this particular species autocarpus okay and then the seed, seeds were raised in a nursery and their percent mortality was evaluated so what they found was uh, seeds or you know seedlings that emerged from seeds that were obtained from a smaller sized population for example if you had less than 3 or less than 4 in population size the percent mortality was high, as high as about 70% and as the population size increased the percent mortality completely decreased and this was largely because of inbreeding and inbreeding depression because in a small population uh, there are, since there are very few individuals there is inbreeding among them and this would lead to lower yields and uh, these captive bred populations were susceptible to diseases largely because they have had very low genetic diversity okay and uh, because of the all these genetic uh, disorders or you know genetic defects because of inbreeding uh, despite a, a number of efforts that were made the we could not recover indian cheetah uh, from the brink of extinction and uh, it went into extinction and there have been a number of other classic studies of the, to show the importance of genetic diversity and why there is important to maintain a population size much more uh, or you know there is a there is a cut off uh, and uh, if the population size reduces below that you know there would be a severe inbreeding resulting in genetic depression or inbreeding depression this is an example of a butterfly meta population where uh, you know on the x axis you have the genetic diversity on the y axis is the population probability of extinction so as the genetic diversity increases the probability of extinction decreases or in other words those populations which had low genetic diversity 
had a higher probability almost about 1% or 90% probability of extinction uh, in those butterfly meta populations this were the butterfly population which were bred of for at the you know uh, different populations were bred which had different levels of genetic diversity and when they were released into the wild and recaptured back to look at the probability of extinction and they found that those populations which had very low genetic diversity they were not able to recover uh, imp implying that many of them had gone extinct in the wild and this is not just true for birds or animals it's also true for plants and as i told you in 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 the western ghats or in in, in uh, india there are a number of plants not just medicinal plants there are a number of plants which are uh, critically endangered whose population size is much much low much less than even 500 breeding individuals and for many of these populations their geographic distribution is restricted the population sizes have shrunk largely because of habitat destruction and as well as uh, many of these species are you know destructively harvested from the wild uh, their fertile habitats are altered and uh, regeneration is hindered and overall the population the overall the genetic diversity of these species is reduced leading to um, and many of them are also showing uh, inbreeding or inbreeding depression in the wild and what would happen to small populations so this is again a classical uh, you know graph which shows in a small population uh, because of inbreeding and random genetic breed uh, random genetic drift there would be loss of genetic variability and uh, this loss of genetic variability would lead to reduction in individual fitness and population adaptability which in turn would again lead to lower reproduction and higher mortality and then it would lead to further reducing the population size so this is the extinction vortex and unless you know we you know there is a mediation to recover this particular species it would go extinct okay and so uh, some of the critical issues are as i mentioned for many of these plants or or for example for many of the plants or anim animals which are critically endangered their population size is very very low far below the size that can sustain themselves naturally and since they cannot sustain themselves naturally and they were reached a critical stage there is a need for rebuilding their natural population and therefore for many of these species we need to have a robust and uniform protocol for their conservation okay and uh, therefore there is an urgent need to carry out recovery program for a number of critically endangered species otherwise we are likely to push these populations of these species uh, to very low levels uh, to levels which where we cannot even recover and they would make indian cheetah and uh, we are already seeing a local extinctions of meta populations of some species and there is also local extinction of species and unless we take care to i uh, intervene they we would see a global extinction of many of these species so what are the species that need recovery programs so you know as i mentioned and as i told you about the cost of recovery program recovery programs actually take a lot of time as well as a lot of resources to carry out recovery program okay so they are quite expensive and hence we need to have a strong criteria to identify species that we can actually take up for recovery program and if you look at uh, if i just put you know i'm just putting back the threatened species list in india as i told you we have a number of plants and animal species which are under the threatened category or which are which need the recovery program uh, so there are about 1116 uh, uh, plants and animals which are under the threatened category or which are under the critically endangered or endangered or vulnerable category for all these we need to have a recovery program to take place but this 1000 1116 is again a big number okay we cannot again go on to recover all of them and we need to again prioritize which are the species where we need to do recovery program one of the one of the hello uh, sjc can you please mute your mic uh, sjc 2030 yeah thank you Oh, oh. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, there's a lot of background noise. Uh. In the last, okay. la, 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 last one, that is Ambani. Yeah, oh no, Mukesh Ambani. Oh no, it. Okay. Yeah. So, if you look at uh, species in India, as I mentioned, there are more than about thousand uh, hundred and sixteen uh, plants and animals which are under the threatened category. and uh, we need to develop a sound uh, 
objective to uh, conserve and shortlist these thousand three hundred and sixteen plants and animals for recovery program and develop a robust quantity protocols for their recovery. And recovery conservation program should be based on such robust protocols so that we have minimal failures. So uh, I'm just talking about plants today um, because I've been working on plants. Though I have highlighted some animal examples, I'm largely going to talk about plants. So we have been doing a you know, developing a criteria for prioritizing plant species for recovery, and we have categorized them into uh, four categories and grouped these species into these categories. The first category are those species which are globally threatened. That means these are the species which need recovery because they are very narrowly endemic species which have very few population sizes. So among these are the uh, Semicarpus cardinalis, uh, Seropagia fantastica, Ubardia heptoneuron. I'll come to these uh, examples, which are globally threatened uh, because they have a very uh, narrow distribution and they are narrow endemic species. That is, they have they are distributed in one or two populations or very few populations in in India, and they are you know not just in India, but definitely they are occurring only in few pockets. So those those are the globally threatened narrow endemic. And then we have a second category where not just their the species are threatened or critically endangered because they serve, they are in the precarious habitats. For example, some of them are in the mysticar swamps, such as the Gymnocranthera generica, which is endemic to the mysticar swamps. There are other species. I'll come to them later. And there are other species which have some reproductive constraint, and because of reproductive constraint, their population has been declining. Either they are diocese species whose sex ratio has been altered. And because of this, there is no reproduction. And uh, because of that, or their uh, pollinator or their dispersal agent has has declined, resulting in the particular species become they fall under the third category. And the last category is those medicinal plants which are of very high trade and uh, who have been extensively harvested from the wild. And unless we need to, unless we develop protocols for safeguarding those populations, those populations also are likely to go extinct. So these are the four categories. That we have prioritized species that need to be recovered, and we have listed many plant species which uh, are fall into under this category. So we have uh, categorized some species that are in the red category, where without intervention, the species is likely to go extinct. And for some species uh, which are moderately required, for these species, if we can protect the existing populations and model moderate uh, intervention is needed, and if we could. Do that moderate in intervention, the species can recover back from the wild. And uh, there are those which do not require uh, any uh, conservation efforts. Uh, those are just need to be protected. So those are the three different categories. So how do we go about doing a recovery program? So we need to do recovery program at three levels: at the community level, at the individual species level, as well as the meta population level. So, but there are a number of problems, uh, you know, associated. Okay? So we need to look at Look at the founding population size, and uh, because it, as I told you, it has issues with respect to genetic variability, and then we also look have to see, reintroduce those species. We cannot reintroduce them completely in a very different habitat, because you know unless the habitat is suitable for that particular. So that's the second question. First is how many individuals and to be reintroduced, and where to reintroduce, and then third is look at. Other interactive players, the pollinators, the dispersal agents, and other associated species for that particular species, which need to be there together so that it can survive back in the wild, private private area, or well, and also look at the accessibility of that area to carry out the recovery program. And there have been a few recent initiatives uh, in India with respect to uh, species recovery. Uh, there was a uh, in about 15 years back in 2005. There was a national program on recovery of species using biotechnological approaches, which was organized by ATRI US and uh, uh, and Department of Biotechnology, where a number of called in to develop a consensus list and uh, methodological issues were discussed, and, and uh, there were a number of species that were uh, that needed to be recovered. So um, these are the six different species which were shortlisted and uh, where recovery programs were carried out. So after this uh, success of uh, few of these species, another few really, uh, were taken um, bred in the cap.
this ubadia ubadia genus itself is a monotypic genus and with only one particular species in this uh, uh the other species that is there is the uh, seropigia uh, fantastica which is again an endangered species which is a very very beautiful uh, species that's why it was called seropigia fantastica and uh, this particular species was endangered largely because of excessive harvesting of the tubers which actually was believed to be uh, you know believed to have medicinal properties and uh, because of that it was extensively harvested and this particular species was also using tissue culture methods was multiplied and have been reintroduced in many parts of uh, northern maharashtra and northern karnataka especially in the belgaum and tilare ghat area and uh, the other species that we have done is on uh, seropigia fantastica i'll tell you about the story of uh, seropigia fantastica in the next 15 minutes or so so this particular species uh, was uh, you know is a critically endangered tree species uh, and uh, to re introduce this particular species there were about six different institutions that were involved in recovering this particular species this particular species was uh, actively led by uh, the recovery of this particular species was actively led by forestry college sirsi which uh, carried out uh, reproductive biology of this particular species and reintroduction uh, of the species uh, atri and i were in the genetic part of this and trying to see whether uh, populations are in breeding or whether what is the you know what are the levels of genetic variability of the different populations and look and suggesting uh, genetic methods of genetic enrichment methods to recover this particular species uh, there was also kerala uh, in kerala which was uh, involved in reintroduction and monitoring the karnataka forest department uh, was monitoring and giving protection to the populations that we identified and uh, we also tried out micro propagation and uh, bhartiya university in coimbatore was involved in uh, micro propagation and uh, university of agriculture sciences gkvk was involved in mapping and niche modeling and identifying suitable sites for reintroduction of this particular species in the wild so this particular species semicarpus catlecanensis was a you know a newly discovered species when i say newly discovered it was described uh, about two decades back you know in 2000 year 2000 and uh, was given as the name katlekanensis because this particular species was found in a place called katlekan and katlekan in uh, kannada means dark forest okay so the forest which was densely uh, which had a dense canopy and this particular species was in that forest so it was called semicarpus katlekanensis it's a huge gregarious evergreen tree species with more than 20 meters height but this particular species is distributed or, or you know restricted in its distribution it's distributed on the mystica swamps so these swamps are you know low lying uh, areas where water uh, you know uh, flows very slowly in this uh, area okay and uh, if you look at uh, the habitat of the species there are many species in this mystica swamps which are endemic to these swamps okay for example you have uh, uh, apart from mystica uh, fatua there is another species called as dimnocanta canerica which also uh, both these mystica fatua and dimnocanta canerica are endemic along with semicarpus to these swamps apart from these three species we have also mystica malabarica nema tinita which also occur in these swamps okay and uh, these three species semicarpus catlecanensis dimnocanta canerica and mystica fatua are obligate swampy species when i say obligate Uh, so some species even uh, these species cannot even survive 10 meters away from these mystica swamps so they are so tightly bound to these uh, swamp swamps and uh, only there they survive and these have you know different morphological features to enable them to survive in these swampy habitats so they have a particular uh, if you look at their root system for example the knee, one of them is called the knee root this is the knee root of dimnocanta canerica and these are the aerial roots of mystica fatua and you know even semicarpus also has some some similar root system where uh, the roots come out of the soil uh, because of the swampy habitat uh, to breathe and so they have lot of these uh, cells let us cells to actually uh, do the respiration and these are you know uh, but these habitats these mystica swamps are also uh, fertile grounds for growing arecanut as well as paddy and so large number of these swamps have been converted into arecanut gardens and paddy fields and also uh, because of other developmental activities the uh, highways passing through these swamps resulting in a uh, destruction of many of these uh, habitats and once these habitats are destroyed the entire population of these three species is completely gone 
So this Cercapus cutleta is a very narrow distributed species. So when we first uh, did the survey, there were only about four populations. Uh, now we have another population discovered in Goa, which are about there are about so five populations which are all narrowly distributed, which are within the radius of about 20-30 kilometers in radius. And if you look at uh, the populations, you know, um, size in each of these uh, populations. Uh, for example, you know, uh, this is a dioecious species. That is, uh, males and females are in different plants, and we also have few uh, monoecious individuals also, where both the sexes are there in a single plant. But that is found in only one population. But uh, some populations are female biased, some populations are male biased, and uh, totally, when we you know, uh, did the initial assessment in 2001, uh, there are only about 37 or 38 breeding individuals that were found uh, in. in these uh, three four populations and uh, the other problem was there was a sex a skewed sex ratio some uh, male bias some female bias and uh, also there was poor uh, regenerative regeneration class that is there are few very few uh, seedlings that were found in many of these populations and uh, there were a uh, number of constraints so we looked at the sex structure of uh, adult individuals and uh, as i told you we found few male biased populations few female biased population one i mean one male biased and one female biased and one had equal number of male and female and we also monitored their phenology and what we found was there was you know synchronous and asynchronous flowering of uh, individuals and only those females which were in synchronous flowering with the males have bore more fruit whereas the others did not you know, had very less fruiting so there was uh, ecological Uh, no, I referred to constraint. They we also had a ecological constraint in terms of, for example, uh, this particular species uh, seems to be pollinated by uh, an endangered uh, butterfly called Malabar nymph, and the dispersal is carried out. The seeds are dispersed by endangered macaques, the lion-tailed macaques, as well as the hornbills, both of which are again in the endangered list. So uh, the pollinator is endangered. The dispersal agents are endangered, resulting in the species being endangered, as well as the habitat is also endangered. and we looked at the genetic diversity of the species we developed microsatellite markers for the species and looked at the population uh, genetic variability and what we found was uh, very low levels of polymorphism heterozygosity are typical for a dioecious tree species okay and then and we thought you know this particular species despite not being as charismatic as other animal species needs to be recovered okay there were only about 17 breeding uh, females and totally there were only about 90 individuals in 2000 when you know when we first did 2000 2001 when we did the initial assessment and then this was proposed for recovery program so this particular species is critically endangered so it has high habitat specificity restricted only to the mystica swamps has low population size okay less than 90 individuals very low regeneration a number of population showed very few regenerating individuals uh, dioecious breeding system that is the males and females are in different plants and uh, they also have a skewed sex ratio few male and few female biased and then the low genetic diversity so all this were typical uh, for the indian cheetah and so we classified this as the floral indian cheetah and we were wondering whether this would also go the indian cheetah way so we uh, decided to uh, recover this particular species and uh, we thought you know unless uh, we carry out recovery program and genetic enrichment for this particular species this particular species would be doomed for extinction okay so we had up, you know we used two approaches for recovery one was we introduced them into newer habitat uh, or habitats which were you know the swamps which were recovered back where earlier species existed so we reintroduced them into the those new habitat and then we also replenished the existing populations of the species so yeah, in the approach one where we uh, you know uh, went into introduction of these uh, individuals into new sites we did a careful assessment of the habitat for its suitability and this was done using ecological niche modeling tools where we uh, used a modeling tools to assess the habitat suitability with respect to the temperature rainfall and soil characters and then to ensure that the reintroduction site meets the niche requirement of the species and we also looked into other ecological factors especially the climatic uh, soil type slope the other floristic composition the levels of disturbance and uh, also we looked at the logistic uh, factors we looked at land use history 
we try to see only those which belong to the state forest, forest department we re, you know do the reintroduction because if it is in the private hand again uh, you know it may not last too long and then uh, looked at the ownership and the size of this before carrying out the recovery program so to do the niche modeling we actually mapped uh, all the swamp species or all the swamp habitats throughout the western ghats about 74 swamp habitats in the central and southern western survey and uh, we mapped them and uh, we also tried to see if uh, other populations of the species were could be found but unfortunately uh, these species were not found in any of the swamps ex except in those three or four populations that we uh, where, where we found them and uh, we you know did the modeling and uh, identified habitats which were you know excellent habitats for these particular species so we, so the modeling actually indicated uh, swamps which were in the excellent medium and low category and only those species which were in the only those populations which were in the excellent habitats were uh, taken for recovery program and uh, so based on the niche modeling uh, we identified few sites where we did the modeling the second approach was to enrich the existing population uh, to how do we do this enrichment of the existing population so for this we uh, we used a model called as forest gene bank model where we transferred uh, pollen or seeds uh, from genetically you no know, populations which had genetically were genetically rich which had unique alleles or which were more heterozygous but whose population sizes were very very low and then created one large uh, gene pool where we tried to introduce all the genes unique genes from different pop smaller populations into this large genetic pool and so we identified something called as sink population which was quite large in size which had more number of individuals and source populations are those which had very few uh, in number of individuals which may not survive but so many of them had unique alleles and if those unique alleles were brought into one large sink population we, we could you know genetically enrich that large population and conserve the large genetic pool and help maintain the genetic diversity of this particular species so we introduced uh, seeds and seedlings from those source populations into this large sink populations and then uh, so what we did we carried out uh, we raised more than 3000 seedlings of semicarpus catalana canensis as well as about 500 associated uh, swamp species were also raised finer seedlings and these included the uh, jernocanthera canerica and mystica fatua and other associated species which were associated with, with this particular species so there were about 24 species which are closely associated with this semicarpus so all the 24 species were also raised and uh, we planted all of them in the same proportion as that were there in the wild where we saw you know in other swamps and uh, the seeds and seedlings were introduced both in the new sites as well in the uh, we as well as we carried out the genetic enrichment so these seeds and you uh, know seeds were collected in 2006 and nurseries were raised in 2007 and uh, the seedlings were introduced in 2008 the tall seedlings uh, were introduced in 2008 and uh, after that from 2008 till 2013 uh, they were constantly monitored with respect to their growth with respect to their uh, girth and uh, survival and uh, looking at their mortality and things like that and then we also that uh, uh, no as and when there was mortality we also uh, replenished those populations and uh, in 2013 14 uh, we first saw uh, first signs of success where uh, some of them started uh, flowering and fruiting in due time uh, so those were the first signs of uh, success of the recovery program and uh, from 2013 onwards uh, we have been constantly monitoring and uh, see uh, if genetic enrichment would be necessary in case some individuals uh, of you know are wiped out from their populations we have done carried out and we also have expanded uh, you know the other uh, species apart from semicarpus catlacanensis the other species were also monitored especially jamnacanthera canerica and mystica fatua as well as mystica malbarica uh, in these swamps and then uh, those were also genetically uh, uh, you know i mean uh, the seeds and seedlings were raised uh, and then reintroduced into these populations and so the entire swamp habitats were restored and uh, constantly we have been monitoring the success of these uh, programs so this is the overall picture of uh, uh, the recovery of this particular species so this work especially of tree species you know it's a, a tree species as i told you requires a long term uh, approach we need or we you know we took almost about more than a decade to 
to recover this particular species and only after writing in the last 15 years we were able to see the success of this program but at the same time i will not also mention that it was not a work of one institution or one individual where the center uh, success of this uh, project involved coordination of a number of institutes with number of different expertise which who all came together to carry out this recovery program uh, each of them had uh, different success so with that i lend uh, thank you and thank you for this opportunity uh, to share with you the work that we have carried out these are the number of uh, people who are actively involved and there are a number of other students who actually volunteered to as and plant them in those swamps a number of them are there a number of them from the forestry college sirsi who volunteered to take uh, carry those seedlings in in uh, during the rains uh, risk, risking their own lives uh, especially you know these are least infested uh, so m- many of them uh, you know have donated their blood to those leeches and then uh, planted them in these swamps and uh, now we can see the success of this uh, you know and what we i can tell you is now the population size of the sericapus catacalis is more than 500 individuals and uh, four different populations uh, the size is about more than 500 so uh, we have totally about 2000 individuals survive in the wild now in the last 15 years uh, the population size which is less than 100 has now increased beyond 2000 individuals thank you and if there are any questions i will take it